So my new space is still getting set up. I'm still working on that, I'm just moving in. So instead you get another episode of Touching Grass with Phil the Glacial Geek. Enjoy. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another Glacial Geek video. I'm Phil, the Glacial Geek, and today I'm coming to you to talk about something that's kind of been on my mind, uh, just uh, as through all the various things that we do, uh, and that's the the sense of uh, expertise in the the, the world of wargaming, uh, and and how possible it is to become an expert, uh, gain expertise uh, in the in wargaming, and uh, how uh, realistic it is to. Uh, expect people to be experts and how when we turn to people that we view as experts how realistic is it that uh, they are going to be coming from a place of expertise uh, there's no doubting the fact that you can get better at this at the game at the at everything else uh, but uh, I think that there are certain barriers that are in place that keep people from becoming experts uh, in any particular game, uh, I, but I do think there are aspects of the wargaming world that, that do hold themselves open for expertise. Uh, so the, the general idea, the, the, you know, the, the coined term that we get a lot from Malcolm, uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell is uh, the 10,000 hours thing. So if you have 10,000 hours of, of practice, it takes 10,000 hours of practice uh, to become an expert. Uh, and that is generally an idea. It, basically, it's just that you have to have a lot of experience uh, and a lot of practice to become an expert in a, a particular field. Uh, but there are certain aspects of what that practice uh, contains and the fields that they're in that will determine whether or not you can develop true expertise in the situation or whether or not it is just that you're going to get better and you're going to have more experience in it, but not truly be an expert. So uh, in uh, Verisadium's uh, video on, on expertise, uh, it, he talks about uh, four areas that, an air, that you need, that those 10,000 hours need to be involved in for it to uh, truly develop into an expertise. And I want to kind of view those through the lens of wargaming and what we do. Uh, the first one is that the enterprise that you are endeavoring in needs to be in a valid environment. So. For instance, you can be a roulette player. You can play 10,000 hours of roulette. You can have a lot of experience and repeated experience seeing uh, what happens with that game. But because it is essentially just random chance whether or not you will win or lose on it, you can never truly become an expert in roulette because there's no, it could seriously go because of the way that odds work. The odds are very slim, but not impossible that you could get 50 times uh, the getting uh, the, the number 50 on a roulette reel, 50 times in a row. There's no way to predict that. There's no way to discount it either because it's not once you get the 50, the 50 doesn't go away and then you change things. Um, there are things like poker where you can have a little bit more of a control over it, but there's still that aspect of, uh, of, of chance depending upon how the deck is uh, shuffled and such like that and how it's dealt out and how many players there are and what they do. But uh, something like roulette is impossible to do it because it's not a valid environment. There's no way to gain an expertise on a completely random chance. Uh, it's the same thing that you have with picking stocks that on average, the general stock market uh, performs better than most hedge funds, even though it's being led by people who are experts in their field that have had years and years of experience that use certain algorithms and different m methods of, of figuring it out. On average, the the indexes that they have for the for the stock market perform better than any particular hedge fund or any particular fund. Some can do better, some can do worse, but there's no really determining who it can be because it's hard to gain expertise in that because it's not a truly valid environment since stocks go up and down without any control for you to truly know what's gonna happen with it. So in the world of wargaming, there's two aspects of wargaming. There's the hobby side and then there is the gaming side. Uh, the gaming side obviously has the certain the, the aspect of chance that is going to be in every single really game that you play in wargaming uh, with the dice or cards, whatever the particular mechanic is that they use. There's always that aspect of random chance that you can not truly, uh, you know, take into account. So the way we roll our dice 
can be good, it can be bad. We can have hot streaks, we can have uh, poor streaks. Over the course of your wargaming experience, odds are that those dice will come out to an average of about 16% per face. But you can still get five sixes on five dice in one time, get five ones in, in, in five dice in another roll, and that's just the way it is. So there's an aspect that makes wargaming a less valid environment than you have like chess, where it's entirely based upon a rule set and your moving of the pieces. It's a completely valid environment in chess, and that's why you have chess grandmasters, where if you are to play against, if you have an understanding of the game, but you are to play against, say, Magnus Carlsen, he will cream you. He will destroy you because he is a grandmaster. He understands the game. He has the abilities put in the time to truly understand what's happening with this. And he's going to beat you. There's no ifs and or buts about it. He is going to beat you. You know, whereas if you are a competent war gamer and you play a game of Warhammer 40k, there are there is a chance that you could win against someone who is, you know, a world champion, against the world champion. If you play it against like John Lennon, I, you know, you could win. He doesn't win every single one of his games. And true, most of the games he loses are to people that are way better than him. But there is always that chance where if his dice go cold in this in a certain situation and yours go hot in a certain situation that you could possibly win. So the actual game of war game in itself becomes hard to be a valid, a truly valid environment. There are aspects that are certainly controlled, such as understanding the rules of the game, having experience with a lot of aspects of the game, that you can control what you get with it, and it's not a truly, completely random uh, environment. But at the same time, like I said, it's not a truly uh, valid environment for which you're playing there. So there, it becomes harder for you to truly develop an expertise. And like I said, if you come up against someone like, you know, John Lennon in a game, there is a chance that you can win even if you are not an expert yourself because of the fact that there is that aspect of, of invalidness to the environment of wargaming uh, that is impossible to compensate for. But on the hobby side, it's completely controlled by you. You will learn to put paint onto a model. You will do whatever you're doing with your sculpting, with every other aspect of it that is completely in control. It, there's no random chance that if you put down a red paint onto the on, red, put red paint onto a model that it'll be blue there's no there, like that doesn't happen if you're putting a red paint onto a model it will be red and your experience with that paint with your experience with those brushes your experience with those models your experience uh, approaching these different things is completely valid environment because it's under your control it is something that you have that that is that is valid and will be always be predictable into what is going to happen so it's far closer to like a situation that you have like painting that you would have like just general painting that's why you have you know the grandmasters of painting you have grandmasters of chess these are valid environments and the same thing happens in an, in the hobby aspect of wargaming so with valid environment the hobby side is far more valid and therefore far easier to develop uh, these 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 um, the, these aspects of uh, expertise, and that's why when you see it, if you look in the world of miniature painting, in the world of 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 uh, there, there are people that are generally considered to be experts in that field, and they are people turn to them for advice. They might have a YouTube channel. They might have a Patreon. Uh, there are people like Sam Lenz, who I truly believe is an expert in the field because. Uh, he has developed it. He's been practicing for 10,000 hours. Um, the next aspect of whether that 10,000 hours can develop, lead to expertise, uh, is that you are doing, you have repeated uh, experience and that you have feedback on that that is uh, deliverable. So, for instance, a person plays a game of chess, they will get feedback whether they win or lose. You know, a tennis player playing tennis will hit the ball and they'll see if it goes in or if it doesn't go in they can develop an expertise in those position, can, can, in situations because they're under control and their, uh, their practice and their you know, repeated uh, practice of the skill is having a return that is apparent to what they're doing. So, um, for instance, if you're playing a game of Warhammer 40,000, if you win, you did better. 
you know? And if you lose, you know that there are things that you could do differently. And that goes back into the val you know, the valid situation. Like you can never change your dice rolls, but you could change your tactics. You could change how you position your models on the board. You can change how you responded to things. So as you do those games, as you are playing those games, as you are getting experience with this, uh, you are getting feedback with this and it's timely feedback. So it's not that you have to like do it and then hope in the future that you'll maybe under get feedback on whether or not it was uh, the right decision to make. So an instance where this uh, becomes important is uh, in uh, people like guidance counselors or people in that are hiring for companies or for job positions or for schools, acceptance into schools. They don't get timely uh, feedback on whether their choices for those positions are good, worked out good. So they can't develop the understanding and the ability to see patterns that would lead to success that you could with a timely thing. Like I said, a, a Play, person playing chess will be able to see if they if their if their actions were successful because they will win the game. Uh, if they don't, they can learn from that. Tennis player, if they hit the ball, if it goes in, it's good. If it goes out, it's bad. It's very timely. Uh, the feedback that they're getting from their repetitions are is very timely in that ten thousand hours. Uh, so in in war gaming, you can win or you can lose. Uh, you can have a situation go well. You can have a situation go poorly, uh, and you can get that feedback and you can develop uh, these recognition patterns that you can see that it's like, oh, last time I was in this situation, if I well, I went up and uh, did this and it. I lost the game because of this, but now I can know that I can do something differently and see if I have a, a different response. And your feedback becomes instant. You're able to develop that rec pattern recognition that you can get with the gaming aspect. Same thing with the hobby aspect. As you're painting, you can get the feedback so you can see if the, the blends worked. You can see if the edge highlights worked. You can see if the different techniques that you tried uh, produced the effect that you were looking for and whether or not it was what you wanted. And you have that immediate timely uh, feedback for those actions uh, when you're doing the practice of painting. Uh, the next aspect of it is whether or not someone is willing to put in the repetitive uh, efforts that go into it. Um, so if you have, uh, if you know, if you are hitting forehands in, in tennis, you will hit 10,000 hours of hitting a forehand, you can develop that expertise, but you have to keep going at it, you have to keep trying, and you have to keep having that repetitive nature. So if you are painting, if you, are, if you just paint you know, the bare minimum to get your model painted, you're, never, you're, not doing, you're not repeating things. So if you try to paint a different thing each time, you only do green once, you do red once, and then you just keep going all over the place. You don't try these aspects over and over and over again. You don't get better at them. Uh, same thing with wargaming. If you are playing a different game every single day, you can't develop a, a expertise in these games because you are not doing uh, the repeated efforts in the exact same thing. So again, in the gaming aspect, this becomes difficult because there are a a lot of games out there that you might be playing as a war gamer. But on top of that, even if you only play one game, such as Warhammer 40,000, every three years Games Workshop comes out with a new rule set that you have to learn that's going to be different. So every three years, you're basically starting again, learning the the expertise and the and the and the learning your experience within that rule set within that valid set resets every three years. So it becomes hard, unless you play the same edition over and over again, but it's gonna be harder and harder to find people to play against. And most war gamers I know of keep playing other editions, keep playing different games, want to do different things. So it becomes hard to develop that kind of expertise. You know, there are people like John Lennon, I keep picking him up, but he's a good example. He's a great guy, a lot of fun person to meet, and he's also very good at the game of Warhammer 40,000. Uh, he plays a lot of games of Warhammer 40,000. Uh, it is his job, that's what he does with the art of war, is he plays Warhammer 40,000 and he does really well at it. Uh, and he can play, even in those three years, can get in more games than most war gamers are going to play in their entire life within the, within the, the span of that edition. And some of that expertise does carry on. Like you can have tactics, you can have understanding of how the mechanics work. They don't usually completely wipe out the mechanics and start afresh. Like they don't start with a different D, you know, a D6, then a D8, then a D10, and resetting completely like that. There are certain things that carry over, which are important, and you can have that. Uh, but someone like John Lennon, like I said, even within the edition, is going to have a lot of experience being able to play them 
uh, and play that and have that repeated experience within that rule set. But most other people are not going to have that. You know, you could get in maybe a game a week. You might be getting in a game a month. You might be getting a one weekend a month. You get a couple games in at a tournament, the RTT or something like that. Uh, and it becomes hard for you to be able to do that, to develop that expertise. Uh, with painting, it's not as hard because the painting techniques that we use uh, are, you know, have been developed for, you know, centuries, if, you know, decades, if not centuries, uh, that they, people have been doing this. And even new techniques like slap chop are actually grisaille painting, underpainting and things like that, that have been developed for, you know, for hundreds of years that people have been doing this. So uh, you can, within the same set of circumstances, be able to have that repeated experience and you can get those 10,000 hours in painting because that's what it does. And you are in sculpting. There are always these techniques that have not changed for, like I said, centuries uh, that you can develop that skill with. So it becomes a far more easier situation in which to develop that expertise than you would with a the gaming side of the expertise. Uh, and the last aspect, which is usually what prevents people, even if they do it a lot, uh, from becoming experts is that you have to push the bounds of your comfort. The o experts are always doing their practice at the very edge of their abilities because that's where you learn, on that cutting edge of being able to do something. So if you learn a technique and you do that same technique for 10,000 10, hours and you are really good at it, you can become an expert in that one technique, not in painting in general, not in gaming in general. You will only ever be able to do it in that one uh, aspect of, the, of, of what you're doing unless you push yourself. So if you're not trying different techniques, if you're not trying non-metallic metals, if you're not trying edge highlighting, if you're not trying blending, if you're not trying undershading, if you're not trying speed paints or trying you know, different techniques that you work with, uh, if you're not painting different types of models, vehicles, people, larger busts, smaller busts, you know, uh, diorama situations, backdrops. If you're not pushing the bounds of what it is that you can do, you don't develop true expertise because that's what it takes to get that, you know? So for instance, like I said, with a tennis player, an expert tennis player will not have only done forehands for 10,000 hours. They will have done backhands. They will have done slice. They will have tried uh, over, you know, top spin. They will try uh, different types of serves. Uh, they will do different techniques within the realm of what they're practicing to push the bounds of what it is that they can do and what they uh, know to develop that expertise. The same thing, like I said, in painting. If you are trying different techniques, if you're trying wet blending and you are trying undershading, you're trying all these different aspects of it, that's how you develop an expertise. And that's why when you look at the works of the people that are considered the experts in the realm of hobby and painting, they their works can be very different along different as like different points in time in their career or even just even at the same time they may be trying different things and that's how it works and that's how you develop that expertise in wargaming you have to try different armies you have to try different games you have to try different techniques you have to try different detachments different army compositions a lot of us have the one army that we like to collect that we like to play we have a way that we like to play it for instance for myself i don't like playing with bikes so bikes as an aspect of dark angels i'm not very good at and because of that i'm not going to become a dark angel expert because i haven't tried and pushed myself into that discomfort zone until I get more experience and expertise in that. Uh, so like I said before, someone like John Lennon will play every single army that's out there to find the things that work for him and the things that he wants to do. Um, he doesn't just choose the one army and stick with that. He wants to have the experience of everything that's happening, pushing the, the bounds of his, uh, of his comfort within the game of Warhammer 40,000 uh, to learn different things. And even if he doesn't end up be gravitating towards that army. He will know that army much more intimately and be able to respond to it when he faces it on the, on the battlefield, on the tabletop. Um, and painting the same thing. The people who try these different things, they develop that expertise within painting to, to become those experts. So, can you become an expert? Yes, maybe. It really comes down to what it is that you're looking for. And at the end of the day, I think that the importance of this hobby is to find the joy and spark that joy. And that's what it's supposed to bring to people. And if you are not trying to make this your living, if this is not what you are doing to keep the lights on, 
and you're just doing this for fun as a release on the weekends, in the evenings, to do whatever, then don't bother with wanting to become an expert because there's no need for it. It doesn't bring you any added benefit to be an expert if it's not gonna bring you joy. You know, if you like a certain type, a style of painting, and that's all you like to do, if you just like to get tabletop ready because you like to have painted armies when you go play on the weekends, then don't worry about becoming an expert painter. Lean into that, find that comfort, find what's fun for you and do it. And don't worry about whether or not you're becoming an expert or not, because being an expert does not mean that you are any better of a person. It just means that you have more experience and you are more knowledgeable on a topic. And if that's not what you're looking to develop, then don't worry about it. Go out there, have fun, doing what you want to do, and lean into that. And I feel like that's what I do for me. I find what's enjoying for me, and I push myself where I want to. For instance, painting now, for a long time, it was just get it done so it can be painted on the tabletop and look okay. And I got very good at that, doing it really quick. And now I'm trying to push myself. I entered into a painting competition at Nova Open, and I want to paint more busts, so I want to tra tra paint more models. I want to try different types of models. I want to try dioramas, those types of things that I'm pushing myself in those bounds on the edge of what I know and trying different techniques so that I can get better at it and I can develop more of an expertise in that field because to me, that is fun. Developing those skills, developing that knowledge is fun. In the game of, you know, in the wargaming, I only played 40K and Kill Team for a long time. And there was a period there where I was very good and I developed those skills. But I've also realized that for me, I wanna have fun with the game and I wanna be able to go out there and play the kind of games that I wanna try. So that's why I try, you know, Warcry. That's why I'm try I picked up Bushido. That's why I've got, you know, Frostgrave. I've got all these different games that I'm trying now and I'm not gonna become an expert in them because they're not my only pursuit, but I'm having fun and that's important. So can you become an expert in miniature painting? You certainly can. I think it's a, a completely valid environment with repeatable experience with feet, instant feedback or timely feedback and you can push yourself to into the uh, into the uncomfortable zone of experience and, and repetition to get better at it but do you have to no do you want to that's up to you for me it's not as big a deal to become an expert but I'm still going to do those things to push my bounds to get better at what it is that I'm doing so that I can approach it in a better way uh, when it comes to gaming, I've kind of decided that I don't necessarily want to become an expert. I don't need to become an expert. So I'm going to do what's going to be fun for me and I'm going to have fun with it. And I think that's what you should do too. Find out what it is that you want. Find out what it is that, that brings you that joy, what sparks that joy, what, what sparks that interest, what drives you and follow with that. You know, I know there are a lot of people that get into the gaming side that are competitive and that want to do better and they want to just keep getting better. It's that's completely valid. If that's what you want to do, you can continue to get better. And the more work you put into it, the more that you push your bounds, the more that you try new things, the more that you repeat, repeat, repeat what it is that you're doing, you are going to get better. Will you ever become an expert in the gaming side of things? That's debatable because of the sheer nature of what it is that wargaming is. The fact that it has aspects of chance in it make it a less valid environment than something like chess. So if you want to become an expert in Warhammer 40,000, understand that you're setting a very high bar that you're maybe not gonna be able to achieve. So set those reasonable expectations where you just do better and that you continually show up and, 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 and reasonably can expect to do reasonably well at a tournament. And I think that's gonna bring you much more joy in the long run than setting the, the, the ultimate goal of expert as your only valid choice and goal. So that all said, um, I would like to hear what you guys think down below. Uh, like I said, it was just one of those things that like, you know, cause I'm sitting here going like, Phil, you are the glacial geek and you have this YouTube channel and people come and turn to watch your videos. Uh, does that make you an expert? And I wanted to know whether or not me thinking I'm the expert or not, uh, was uh, just clouded by my, you know, innate, um, you know, imposter syndrome where I think, no, of course I'm not, 
or if legitimately I'm not an expert because I couldn't be. And I think that is both. <laughs> I think it's both. I think there are aspects where I don't uh, give myself necessarily the credit that I deserve because of the work I've put in and the fact that people still continue to watch these videos. Uh, but I also think there's an aspect where uh, the, the, the realm that I've entered into uh, might make it very difficult to become an expert. So maybe in painting. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you in another 10,000 hours and see if I become an expert painter. Um, but uh, you know, that, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty high bar that people like Sam Lenz have set for, for me to want to achieve there. So, uh, but let me know what you think below, what you think it's possible. Do you think it's even worth trying for? Do you think it's something that you want to try for? What is it that you're in your uh, pursuits of the hobby do you find more entertaining and more interesting? And it, I mean, it makes a big difference. Like if you are just happy painting your armies to get them painted for the tabletop, then you shouldn't be comparing yourself to people who are pushing the bounds of painting and, 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 and making becoming an expert one of their at, like, stated goals. Because you're not trying for that, and if you're not trying for that, then why are you trying to compete against that? And why are you putting yourself up against that? So understanding what expertise is, understanding what drives expertise, and understanding what it is, takes to get to that level of expertise uh, is a great way to put proper expectations on your performance, on what you do. Because if you're just painting to have fun, if you're just painting a few hours every once in a while to get an army painted so you can go to the game store and play a game with your friends with a painted army, then do not compare yourself to people who are professional painters. You know, as I, as I am recording this right now, uh, and I guess as you're gonna watch this, Sam is right now over in Italy at Monte San Savino at one of the biggest painting competitions in the world. You know, he's over there trying to compete against the world's best because that's what drives him. That's what, that's, what, that's what he wants from his painting is he wants to push the bounds of what it is that he can do and he's very successful at it. And I am on a daily basis wowed by what it is that he can accomplish. You know, I am not Sam and I know that I'm not Sam. So when I compare my work to Sam's, I know that that's an unreasonable expectation to meet. And what it is, is it becomes aspirational where it's like, oof, Maybe if I keep trying, I can get somewhere close to that someday. So use it as a framework, understanding what expertise is, understanding what expertise takes, and understand that it's not always fun and it's not always comfortable. And in fact, it should almost never be comfortable if you're, develop if you're striving for expertise. And if what you're looking for is comfort, joy, and a release, then expertise is not what you're looking for. So put that into that kind of, uh, you know, idea and put it into that kind of context and you're going to find yourself much happier when you do that. So, you know, that's, that's my recommendation on how to use this expertise discussion to kind of frame things for yourself. Um, but let me know what you think down below. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is, as you probably well know, as you saw in the beginning of my video, I'm a member of the Army Painters Factory team. Uh, and with that comes a lot that has been pretty awesome for me to experience. I got to meet a lot of really cool people, go to a lot of cool things, and do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that, uh, the, that the people that got me into a position where uh, that could benefit myself uh, would also get benefit to themselves. So I negotiated when I came onto the team to get a discount code that you guys could use. Um, and it's, uh, if you go to the Army Painter and use the code uh, FACTORYGEEK5, you will get a 5% discount on anything that you purchase there. Uh, that's a way for, uh, it's not a, that, that code in particular is, is not a, um, a, a, a partner code, or it doesn't give me it doesn't give me anything. It's just a way for you to get uh, a discount uh, on what you can buy the paint. So you can try a new product. You can try a new technique. Maybe you want to try to get some of the, the, you know, some of the flexible triads to give yourself some wet blending experience because that's something you've never tried and it seems scary. Or maybe you want to try uh, get a color, the couple colors because you want to try out some non-metallic metals give it a shot. Go out there and use that 5% discount code to get yourself a, a discount so when you can try all these things and push the bounds of what it is that you're comfortable with, you can do it. Or maybe you're just very comfortable with what it is that you want and you know which paints you need and you can just get more there and get a 5% discount. Uh, there is a 10% discount code uh, in my Patreon. They want me to keep that behind the paywall because it's an extra thank you to the people who more directly support the channel. Uh, to them, I am very thankful on a daily basis that you guys have uh, looked to me and been like, that's someone I want to support with my direct support there. 
And if you want to try, if you want to be become a Patreon supporter, uh, go check out the uh, description. There's a link there. Uh, there's also a link down there to my top five favorite uh, products at the Army Painter that can give you an idea of what I've been working with because that's what I've been working with, and I've you know developing understanding of what the products are, and hopefully you guys can get something from that. So uh, I hope you guys have all enjoyed this. I certainly have. I have been Phil, the Glacial Geek, as always, and until next time, stay safe and have fun.